When is someone dead? Death is traditionally defined as the separation of the spirit or soul from a body that no longer functions. But because the soul is immaterial, we do not have any device to determine the exact moment of death when the spirit or soul departs. So as a safeguard against declaring death prematurely, the loss of heartbeat, breathing, and the passage of time have been used for millennia to be sure that the spirit, the person inside the body, has departed. But in 1968, 13 men changed the definition of death. They said, our primary purpose is to define irreversible coma as a new criterion for death. No, there were no new tests, studies, or evidence that people in an irreversible coma were now somehow dead. The only rationale given by the committee for why irreversible coma should be equated with death was utility. It would free up beds in intensive care units, and it would facilitate organ transplantation. But does a redefinition for the sake of utility change the reality? I'm Dr. Heidi Klessig, a retired anesthesiologist and pain management specialist and the author of The Brain Death Fallacy. In 1981, this redefinition of death was codified into law as the Uniform Determination of Death Act, or the UDDA for short. The UDDA states that death occurs when an individual has sustained either, number one, irreversible cessation of circulatory and respiratory functions, or number two, irreversible cessation of all functions of the entire brain, including the brain stem. And all 50 U.S. states have adopted this act in some form. But in 1998, this redefinition of death was disproved by Dr. Alan Schumann, a pediatric neurologist at UCLA, who documented 175 cases of people declared brain dead who lived after the declaration of their deaths under the UDDA, one for ultimately more than 20 years. So in 2008, the President's Council on Bioethics Controversies in the Determination of Death was convened to study these facts. This council agreed that since biological function continues after an accurate diagnosis of brain death, a re-examination of the neurological criteria for death was needed. They noted that Dr. Schumann's work left two options. Number one, abandon neurological criteria for determining death altogether. Number two, develop a new rationale for explaining why neurological criteria should equal death. Despite what appears to be the more complicated of the two options, you know which one they chose. They developed a new rationale based upon philosophy rather than biology, basing death upon abilities. The 2008 President's Council defined total brain failure as follows. An organism is no longer alive when it ceases to perform the fundamental, vital work of a living organism, the work of self-preservation achieved through the organism's need-driven commerce with the surrounding world. And without any reason being given, the Council decided that the fundamental work of a living organism is breathing and consciousness. This is an ability-based definition. Now, brain death is based upon a completely arbitrary degree of disability, not upon biology. In fact, the 2000 President's Council failed to accurately reflect the science. People with a clinical diagnosis of brain death still have certain brain functions. Number one, 20% of those tested still have brain waves on their electroencephalogram, or EEG. And, in fact, not many are tested because an EEG test is no longer required for a diagnosis of brain death. In fact, the latest brain death diagnostic guidelines states that no ancillary tests, not even cerebral blood flow studies, are 100% sensitive and specific for brain death. Second, 50 to 84% of people with a clinical diagnosis of brain death still have a functioning hypothalamus, a part of the brain responsible for things like uh, temperature regulation, electrolyte balance, sex drive, sleep, awareness, and pain. 
unless people with a brain death diagnosis exhibit wound healing, fighting off infections. And as an anesthesiologist, I can personally verify that they have the same stress response to the incision to remove organs as anyone else. And all of these are the work of self-preservation. In 2023, the American Academy of Neurology released a new brain death guideline because, and I quote, of the lack of high quality evidence on the subject, the new AAN guideline was determined by three rounds of anonymous voting. Now, we've been declaring people brain dead for nearly 60 years. Wouldn't you think that we'd have some high quality evidence for it by now? The guideline allows people with partial brain function to be declared dead, which means we continue to have a brain death guideline which does not comply with the law under the UDDA, since the UDDA requires the irreversible cessation of all functions of the entire brain, including the brain stem. So from 1968 to the present, what has been driving this redefinition of death? Organs. In 2006, Dr. Elko Vedix, a neurocritical care specialist at Mayo Clinic and one of the authors of the current Brain Death Diagnosis Guideline, admitted this. The diagnosis of brain death is driven by whether there is a transplantation program or whether there are transplantation surgeons. I do not think brain death examination now in practice would have much, if any, meaning if it were not for the sake of transplantation. Dr. Loris Kelgen, the director of the Bioethics and Humanities program at the Iowa Carver College of Medicine agrees. He said, we do not need modified definitions of death to let bodies of dead people be cremated or buried, or to allow dying patients to die by withholding or withdrawing life-sustaining interventions which are not helpful. Organ transplantation is the motivational context of debates about definitions of death. I maintain that redefining death in order to use living humans for the sake of their viable organs is unethical. The contrived definition of brain death has always been based on utility, not scientific fact, and only continues for the sake of the organ transplant industry. Since 1968, most doctors have surprisingly accepted this definition despite the lack of evidence, many based on ignorance, others based on convenience. But not everyone agrees this practice should be continued. In 2009, doctors Joseph Verheige, Mohammed Rady, and Joan McGregor wrote this, heart beating or non-heart beating organ procurement from patients with impaired consciousness is de facto a concealed practice of physician-assisted death, and therefore violates both criminal law and the central tenet of medicine not to heart patients. In 2018, David Rodriguez Arias, a PhD in moral philosophy said, the history of death determination in the context of organ donation can be described as an indoctrinating attempt to settle a moral controversy. Dr. Alan Schumann, one of the world's leading authorities on brain death, wrote this in response to the 2008 President's Council decision. Just as cigarette ads are required to contain a footnote warning of health risks, ads promoting organ donation should contain a footnote along these lines warning. It remains controversial whether you will actually be dead at the time of the removal of your organs. Controversy in the determination of life and death is unacceptable.